going into the heart of the Middle East and then eastwards. We are facing situations which will have to be dealt with differently than they have been dealt with up to now. Catch somebody and say to me, where are you from? He'll say, I'm from Najaf. Oh, Najaf. Well, what else? He said, well, I'm from the Zuberi tribe. What else? He'll say, oh, I'm a Shiite, a Sunnite. But what else? Oh, yes, I'm a Saudi. The national so-called uh, aspect, ingredient, in the life of the ordinary man in the Middle East doesn't begin with the state. And this is an issue which has far-reaching consequences. When it comes to the problem of what's going to happen, for instance, in Libya, will it remain a unified state? Or will it split up into Kirinaika and to Tripolitania? This, to a large extent, will be decided by the tribes. And by the way, intelligence-wise, it's very difficult to assess the power or the, or the, or the uh, capability of a tribe. In intelligence, we have two focal subjects we have to deal with. Intentions and capabilities. When we faced up to the Egyptians on the eve of the Six-Day War, I remember a meeting one morning chaired by the then Director of Military Intelligence, General Aaron Yariv. And I remember uh, after Nasser, who was then uh, the President of Egypt, closed the states of Tehran. You remember he closed the states of Tehran. So there we were sitting there and A said one and B said war and what does Nasser intend? And after 20 minutes uh, Yariv took his uh, fist and struck the table and he said stop it. I'm not interested in intentions, I'm interested in capabilities. Because intentions can be intentions can be intentions. Bad intentions, good intentions, but they're intentions. And the rock bottom is the capability. And I want to talk to you this morning about the capabilities related to the Palestinians and us. Because that is what is going to count in the end. Our capability, their capability, the limits of their capability, the limits of our capability, the limits of international capabilities, capabilities. As far as the Israeli-Arab conflict is concerned, both parties are constrained by their capabilities and not mainly by their intentions. I don't think it's the realm of capability of either the Prime Minister of Israel or the President of the Palestinian Authority to implement a permanent solution to the problem. Let me begin with the Prime Minister of Israel. The Prime Minister of Israel is on record as being supportive of a two-state solution with a whole list of arrangements in this two-state solution. This would entail, first and foremost, a massive population uh, movement. And I don't believe that it's in the capability of Israel today to effect a massive population movement. But the degree of mistrust that the population in Israel has towards the intentions of the other side and the degree of mistrust that the other side has as to the intentions of the Israeli side preclude the implementation of such. And as far as the Palestinians are concerned, not is there, is there no consensus, but there is no control. There's no central control on the Palestinian side of all the segments of Palestinian society or of Palestinian territory for that matter. And the fact of the matter is that even if Mahmoud Abbas were to sign a peace agreement, his capability to implement it in Gaza would be uh, questionable to say the least. The time it needs to implement a solution of this kind will probably be, have to be stretched over a large number of years. Well, in five and ten years' time from now, I don't think that anybody can guarantee that Mr. Netanyahu will be Prime Minister of Israel. He might, he might not. And certainly I don't think anybody can guarantee who will be the leader of Palestine. Leaders don't like to implement agreements reached by their predecessors. They like to implement agreements which they have. More than ever before, because of the shifting sands in the Middle East, time is in the essence on implementing an agreement. And that is the crux of it all.